Hello everyone, welcome back to a new series of tutorials. My name is Juan and today I'm going to be talking about DSG models. This is going to be a series of tutorials with diverse episodes where I'm going to be showing in each of them how to estimate the models, how to solve the math, how to put all the equations into the software and how to obtain some impulse responses and also some forecasts. So for this series of tutorials, you have all the material available in the link in the description. And there's also an option for you to be able to buy all the, uh, the slides and the do file uh, for, for Stata. And also there's, there's going to include a paper where I wrote step-by-step uh, step how to solve the models and some other information which may be useful. Also, um, you can send me an email in the email in the description. If you are interested in a webinar where I can explain detail uh, with more details, some aspects of these type of models. So what's going to be the outline? So we are going to be talking about business cycle theories. Um, so here is when we'll be going through neoclassic models, which is the formerly the benchmark RVC model. And then we're just going to be mentioning what are the differences between the new Keynesian models when we are talking about DSG models, which is just basically the, the benchmark RVC model, but it's going to include some Keynesian frictions. Finally, we are going to finish this tutorial of today talking about the introduction of the RVC model. We're going to be discussing who are the agents, what is the shock, and how we are getting to the equilibrium. So to begin with, DSG stands for Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium. We are talking about dynamic models because the Asians have to make decisions not only based on today, but also on the uncertainty of tomorrow. It's going to be stochastic because there's going to be a shock that is going to be impacting in our model. And then the variables, the endogenous variables in the model are going to be responding to that shock. Finally, we are talking about general equilibrium because the decisions of the agents are going to be optimal coming from uh, the interaction between them to, to the shock that we're imposing in the model. So what are DSG? They are models which focus on economic growth and business cycles. They aim to replicate business cycle properties. So I think it's important then to understand that DSG models are going to be focusing on business cycles, but what is a business cycle? Where it's important for you to know and understand that business cycles are fluctuations around the trend of real GDP. There are different forces that can uh, make an economy expand, contract, um, get to a boom or a recession, and all these things are what is going to be building the, yes, the uh, business cycles. As you understand, real GDP is not a straight line. It's going to be choppy. There's going to be moments where you're seeing that the economy is expanding. Those are good moments for, for most of the inhabitants in the economy. But then there's moments where there's going to be a contraction uh, reaching to a recession if that contraction lasts at least two quarters. So all this is what constitutes the uh, business cycles. Yes. So these type of models are going to be focusing then in understanding what drives these um, the cycles and what's the impact, yes, of the diverse policies made. Uh, so how do these models begin? Well, in the 80s, new macro micro funded models emerged post the Lucas critique from 1976. Um, DSG models are commonly applied by monetary and fiscal authorities for policy analysis and forecasting. It will allow us to study the effect of diverse policies and there are two theories, as I just mentioned, the non-Keynesian and the new Keynesian. It's very important that in these tutorials, I'm introducing you to these topics. Yes, it's, it would be nice and very interesting for you to be able to um, get into some of the literature that I'm going to recommend later so you can feed from more information and to expand your knowledge as well. So let's get into non-Keynesian models. We are talking about the real business cycle model which some of the things that you have to understand of RBC models is just a neoclassic model. It's very similar to a solo model. I'm sure you have seen a solo model in economic growth or some macroeconomic courses. So we are incorporating into these type of growth models, shocks. 
the former paper of uh, RVC models is you can read Keelan and Prescott from 1982. That's how everything began in the early 80s. You have to understand that in these type of models, in RVC models, there is no role for monetary policy. The money in these models is neutral. There is no real effects of money in these type of models. So what's what's going to create business cycles in these type of models, right? Um, what's going to be creating the fluctuations about trend in real GDP? So basically the answer to that is that business cycles are caused by real shocks, which is a productivity shock. It's basically a technology shock. So what you have to understand then is, based on this theory, is that all the changes in technology is what is driving the business cycles. When the, uh, pro the productivity or the technology expands, then the business cycles expand. But when the technology uh, starts to diminish their productivity, then the, the economy will start to contract. Yeah? So basically, according to this theory, all the business cycles are caused by fluctuations in the productivity or technology. The next thing that these type of models are going to assume is a perfect competition. So basically, um, there's going to be perfect competition and information. And prices are going to be elastic. This is very important because this is what Im imposes. Yes, and when there is a shock, yes, the adjustments are going to occur immediately. Yes, there's not going to be any uh, market failures. A last observation I can make about non keynesian models is that because the prices are elastic, yes, there's going to be some properties in the data that we are not going to be able to observe. Yes, so the model is going to be producing some results that maybe it will not be matching the, the data. That can be the case, for example, for wages. Um, that can be the case for investments. Yes, sometimes investments are very volatile and there can be uh, frictions that you can add into these type of models to reduce volatility or wages. We are assuming that when there is a shock, your wage is going to change immediately. But in reality, the truth is that it takes some time for uh, probably the labor force to be able to negotiate new salaries with their, with their unions. There's different things that can impact the way that prices are going to respond to shocks in the economy. So that's when it comes to play uh, the Keynesian models. Moving into new Keynesian models, new Keynesian models are models that are going to be basically doing the same theory of micro-funded macroeconomic models based on including some Keynesian features. So there can exist frictions in these models. We're talking about market failures. So because there exist market failures, there's going to be different uh, things that are going to be happening in our model that will prevent from immediate market adjustments. So wages are going to be sticky, the prices, nominal prices are rigid. So these are all features that I have just discussed, um, are features that when there is a change, there is a shock in the economy, the prices are not going to adjust immediately. There's going to be diverse frictions, which is going to delay the adjustment of the, of the markets. There's going to be monopolistic competition as well. There's going to be adjustment costs on investments. So basically what this impacts is that investment cycle is not going to be as volatile as maybe we can see in some RBC models. And basically all these delay in market adjustments, meaning when there is a shock, the market does not adjust immediately, there will be a role for monetary policy. So according to these type of models, because there are market failures, there is a role for monetary policy, to try to interfere in the business cycle. Yes, yeah? so this is just um, a topic that I can point out there, and it's something for you to investigate. Yes, and this is a question that is valid, and is whether there is a real role for monetary entities to try, yes, to articulate, to regulate business cycles. Yes, are governments and uh, and uh, these type of policies of monetary policies good or bad for business cycles? This is something definitely. Um, that is a question for you guys to be able to investigate further. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting topic. So let's get into our model then that we are going to start. It's very important that if we are getting into DSG models that you understand the most simple model, which is how everything began. It's just a simple RVC model. So basically in our RVC model, we have the economy. It can be any given economy, 
Uh, it can be the United States. It can be the world economy. Um, any country you are from, you can use data for your for your economy, and we can try to fit an RBC model. In our economy, there are going to be households. Yes, there are going to be families living in this economy. But these families are not living alone. They need to eat. Yes, they need to to buy their goods. There's going to be firms that are in our economy producing stuff. So let's see then in the next slide how these two agents are going to interact. So interaction is pretty simple. The households are going to be consuming the firm's output. They are going to be working. Yes, they are going to be supplying labor and they are going to be investing in capital. Basically, the families, anytime they work, they are going to be using that money to consume but whatever money is left, they are going to be saving that money. In our model, there is no costs for savings. So anytime that you have a saving, the family will be able to immediately turn that uh, saving into investment. Yes. So basically, families consume. Whatever they don't consume, they save it. And whatever they save is going to turn into investment. And what does the family invest in these type of models? Well, they are investing in capital. So who is going to be using that capital? Where well, the firms are going to be using the capital. And wh who are the families going to be buying all these things? Well, they are going to be buying all the products and the goods and services to the firms. So basically here is where we have the firms that in order to produce, they're going to demand labor to the families. In return, the firms are going to pay families wages. They're also going to demand the capital to be able to work to be able to produce, they need the machines, they need the capital. They are going to be getting the capital from the households, from the families. In return, they are going to be paying returns to the families for that capital. And finally, of course, the most obvious things is that the firms are producing the goods and services in this economy. Yes, I would like to mention this is very important. There are some models where the families are not the owners of the capital. Yes, in some uh, models, you can set the firms are the owner of capitals and the households have assets from the firms. Yes, so um, I'm just mentioning this because if you are taking a course um, in school, in university, um, postgraduate school, whatever it is, the course you're taking, uh, chances are that your professor um, can explain the model as firms owning the capital. So it's just a very small change. It won't really impact much. Um, uh, when it comes to solving the math and stuff, but we're going to get into that later. So what's going to be the shock in the model? Well, the shock in the model is going to be the productivity of the firms, yes? Basically, when the firms are more productive, if there is a shock that increases the productivity of these firms, then they are going to be increasing their output, yes? They are going to be demanding more labor. Because they are demanding more labor, wages are going to increase. And in other words, when there is a productivity shock, yes, the factors in the economy are going to increase. Um, it's very important that remember what we talked at the very beginning. Yes, we are talking about uh, cycles. Yes, we are talking about what is causing these fluctuations in real GDP. Yes, along the time. Basically, this is what's doing it in this type of models. It's a productivity shock uh, on the technology of the firms. If they increase their productivity, they will be able to expand uh, the output, but if their productivity decreases, then the output will decrease. So basically, finding an equilibrium is finding a set of variables, consumption, leisure, labor, capital, and a set of prices, wages, and returns, yes, that are going to make the families to decide optimally, and the firms to decide optimally, and the markets with clear. So basically, this is the idea of the equilibrium, yes? So as a summary of what we have discussed, we have an economy with two agents. There's going to be a productivity shock, which will Im impact on the different variables in our economy. And after this shock, there's going to be a new set of prices that is going to determine the equilibrium and will make the markets clear. To finish with this class, today I'm going to recommend some literature for you to start reading. The first paper, of course, is Kidlin and Prescott uh, from 1982. Then you have uh, the paper from Prescott from 1986, Theory Ahead of Business Cycle Measurement. That's a really nice paper. You have then uh, Macallium 
real business cycle models from 1988. That's a paper I recommend to read. Moving next, we have Sergio Revelo and Robert King from 1999, Resuscitating Real Business Cycles. That's also a suggested literature. And finally, uh, for today, I would suggest to read Gregory Mankiw, Real Business Cycles, A New Keynesian Perspective from 1989. This is a literature that you can start reading. Um, if you don't really understand the math involved in these papers, don't worry, we're getting into that on the next uh, tutorials. We are going to be talking about what's the uh, math involved in, in solving these models. So that's going to be all for today. Uh, thank you very much for watching this tutorial. And if you have any questions, please leave your comments. Um, also, remember that you can buy the material. There's a link in the description. Um, and finally, I would like to invite you to subscribe to my channel if you would like to get more tutorials about these topics. I'm going to be posting very shortly the second tutorial where we are going to be solving the, the problem, the RBC problem of the, of, the, of the houses and also the problem that the firms are facing in these type of models. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you.